So sadly, it would seem that Chris has not gotten our message. So I will preface these remarks with, and Chris has said that he is saddened and sick that he was unable to join us, um, no more so than me. Um, uh, so uh, I will say that so what Chris was going to speak on was um, the topic of uh, social justice and engaging with marginalized communities at the University of the District of Columbia, uh, and a discussion of the rewards and challenges of archivists engaging in with up underrepresented and marginalized communities at a historically black college and university in Washington, D.C. Um, so that he said uh, that most of his planned remarks were focused on the rewards section. Uh, the assignments originally started with a focus on student life and organization, including fraternities and sororities, which were uh, always uh, very popular and attracted a great deal of student interest. Uh, in the past four or five years, there has been much more student interest in student activism over the years, uh, both in terms of issues involving the administrations uh, actions and in terms of frequent budget cuts. Uh, there have also been several examples of political activism in UDC's history, including uh, various protests involving national and international issues. And all of these have attracted uh, student interest. So the University of the District of Columbia is a, uh, as I said, a, a historically back college and university created from several predecessor institutions, including the Minor School, the Wilson Teachers College, uh, the DC Teachers College, and the Federal City College, and the Washington Technical Institute. Um, Marilla Minor formed the Minor School in 1851. Uh, UDC is the only public university in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's the only uh, land-grant university in the District of Columbia. And uh, since Marilla, uh, Mertilla Minor formed UDC in 1851, uh, the UDC has played a key role in the role of educating African Americans in, the, in DC. So HBCUs, uh, before the Civil Rights Movement, uh, they have uh, offered African Americans one of the only pathways to a college degree. Uh, and today, HBCUs continue to provide uh, an inclusive and supportive environment to African Americans to obtain higher education. Uh, so HBCUs tend to uh, offer a welcoming and inclusive environment uh, to all of those who attend there. It's uh, one of the appealing features of HBCUs and all educational uh, institutions is that they should be a welcoming environment for people of all backgrounds. Uh, I will say, I will insert here that I used to say that when I went to college, it was, you know, it was not reality. It was like, you know, it was, you went off to college to, you know, and you got out and you had a degree at the end, but it was you know, a welcoming environment. So students aspire to be themselves and be part of an inclusive and welcoming culture. HBCUs have always provided a safe and affirming space for black students. Uh, and HBC, HBCUs install, instill cultural pride. Uh, they also shield students from having to navigate racism, unfortunately found at other types of institutions. And again, something that we've uh, even seen uh, recently with the uh, incidences at uh, uh, Bowie State University and uh, some of the instances uh, recently uh, outside of Baltimore. Uh, so why every student should learn how to use archives. Uh, this is uh, something that, again, I will say, you know, not just, again, to step on what Chris is saying. Uh, through the 
National History Day program even, you know, that we should be instilling in our students and, you know, through an in, a strong internship program and things like that. It's, uh, archives are not just places where documents are, or records are stored. They are witnesses to the African American and American history. Uh, using archival materials allows our students to engage directly with people and stories from the past. Uh, students can hear about events directly from those who experienced them. Uh, a good archives also can have a good oral history program. You know, if you have a good oral history program, that's a good way for students to interact with people who lived these stories. Um, uh, again, parenthetically, using my own background, uh, when I first came to Washington, I worked for the International Monetary Fund, and I uh, did some oral histories with people where I interviewed a man who was at the founding conference for the International Monetary Fund. And, you know, I sat there and I would, like, listen to these stories that he would tell us about, you know, that they would plan the international financial system for hours during the day, and then they would go down to the bar, and they would plan their evening over bourbon and, you know, cigarettes. And I was like, this is how things worked in the 40s, you know. But uh, So students can relate their lives and experiences of primary source creators to their own lives and experiences. Uh, archival records serve to strengthen collective memory and protect people's rights property and identity. So HBCUs have a long-standing tradition of developing collections that document the rich African-American experience. With rare and unique materials, HBCUs have the potential to reach current narratives, to enrich current narratives with the history of American education, the scholarship, the activism, of American education, the scholarship, activism, and publications of university presidents, faculty, students, and alumni. Despite their significance, many HBCU archives are not easily accessible. Much of this has to do with the historical underfunding of these archives. I mean, so there are many challenges that uh, HBCUs face in serving their student populations. Many are first-generation college students. Some are still not completely college-ready when they started. Uh, many have weak research skills. Uh, they have not, they don't have much of a fam familiarity or an understanding of history. They may have had learning dif difficulties or other disabilities in their uh, previous school careers. Some are faced with pressing family needs. They are parents themselves, or they need to support their families. Uh, they may have uh, financial d challenges, or you know, they're on serious financial aid, or that they hinders their academic progress. They may be faced with issues of day-to-day -day needs. They have not had an opportunity to learn much about history uh, or archives prior to coming to the university. Uh, they may not be familiar with archives or understand the relevance or usefulness of archives. Um, they may not have any uh, background in the use of archives. These are all things that we as archives professionals should, you know, instill and use upon them, you know, and impress upon them that, as we heard so many times earlier today, we have a responsibility as archivists to protect history, to preserve history, to make sure that it goes forward. Um, so to protect our heritage for another generation. So the rewards that we get from serving our students we see the experience of history coming to life for our students through the use of primary resources. We see the students learn things new and fascinating and relevant to them. I'm very excited.
Chris Anglum has entered the waiting room. I have never been more excited in my life to be interrupted by a presentation. Chris, can you hear me? Chris? I think you're muted. You're muted. He can't hear you. Chris, can you hear me? Chris, can you hear me? Um, very vaguely. <laughs> Chris, I've never been so happy to hear your voice. Uh... All right, what can you see? How was his audio for you guys? Cody? Did you hear me okay? I can, it's faint, but I can make out a lot of okay. most of the words. Next slide, please. 
And, and one of their advantages today of, of, of HBCUs is that they provide a welcoming and inclusive environment. One, one appealing factor of feature of HBCUs and all educational institutions we hope is that they provide a welcoming environment for people of all backgrounds. HBCUs that uh, uh, students aspire to be themselves and be part of an inclusive, welcoming culture, and HBCUs do this uh, very, very well. HBCUs have always provided a safe and affirming space for African American students, so they instill a sense of cultural pride. They also shield students from having to navigate uh, racism, unfortunately found in uh, many other types of uh, uh, institutions. Okay, next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Why is so fun? Since we're talking about uh, learning about our guides, we talked a bit about uh, uh, about HBCUs, so we have a bit of background on this. Now we'll shift a little to talking about uh, HBCUs and our guides. And, uh, what, and so we need to first understand why every student should learn how to use archives. So archives are not just places where documents or records are stored. They're witnesses to uh, African American and American history using archival materials allow the students to engage directly with the people and stories from the past. Students can hear about events directly from uh, those who experienced them. The students can also relate the lives and experience of experience as a primary source of creators to their own lives and experience. Archival records also serve to strengthen the collective memory and protect people's rights, uh, properties, and, uh, and identity, chiefly rights and identity, and again, uh, help uh, them understand the past they came from and, and why things are the way they are today. And it can be awesome, uh, a source of inspiration, pride, and uh, uh, growth over time. Okay, next slide. Next, uh, some of the significance, particularly of HBCU archival collections, is that HBCUs have had a long-standing tradition of developing collections that document the rich African American experience. With rare and unique materials, HBCUs have the potential to enrich current narratives with the history of both. American edu African American education, scholarship, and activism of university presidents, faculty, students, and alumni. Despite their significance, however, in many HBCUs, uh, archives are not easily accessible, or much of this has to do with the uh, historical underfunding of, of these archives and uh, uh, the fact that they not, have not uh, always been well publicized either. Okay, uh, next slide. Next slide. So uh, some of the challenges that we have in particular in serving our students at HBCUs are that many are first generation college students. Some are not completely ready when they started. Many have uh, great research goals. Many, uh, may, uh, many have, may not have a familiar or understanding of history. Some may have learning difficulties or other disabilities. Some are fed family needs that they, our parents are need to support their families so that is an added stressor to uh, the pursuing academic careers and they face some serious financial challenges which hinder their academic progress. Okay, next slide. And the further challenges may be uh, are the many are faced with the issues of day, day needs and have not had the opportunity to learn much about history or archives coming to the university. They, they may not be familiar with archives or understand the relevance or usefulness of archives and they must have a, no background and must have no background in the use of archives or uh, uh, the uh, for uh, any sort of grounding or understanding of archives. So we're starting from a uh, very much from the beginning stages and uh, teaching them about the importance and significance and, and uh, of archives and how this can be an enjoyable experience for them. Okay, next slide. In some of our rewards in serving our students, they are seeing that the students uh, enjoy and owning their history and culture in ways that they have not before, seeing uh, students view the history from the excitement of the first uh, person perspectives, uh, stories of real people living in 
real lives and making real contributions to their community. So the stories are there, but that can be very compelling and the, to our to our students. We're not talking about history in terms of merely dates and names and colors. We're, we're, we're seeing actual, actual stories being told of special environments of the city of Seeing a history, them owning their, uh, enjoying and owning their history and culture in ways that they have not recorded. Seeing the students view history from the inside of the first person perspective, the stories of the real people living real lives and making contributions in their community, seeing how students can add to the body of, of knowledge by adding their own stories and experiences or stories of their friends and family members to, uh, uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this whole of uh, Story and histories. So, uh, in the, in in the, my experience of, a, of a, as an archivist and teaching uh, uh, students how to use uh, the our archives, primary sources, and so on, we uh, first start off with a, uh, primarily focusing on the uh, on the institutional history and also on the student organization, the student life, uh, and the uh, sorority. Germany's have got a, a, a great deal of interest in it and a great deal of and that many of the students found this to be very beneficial or very helpful and so on. In recent years I, I began uh, noticing a much more student interest in uh, of the areas of social justice and uh, uh, UDC's uh, role in promoting social justice and, uh, with my, and uh, we've added more that in terms of our uh, uh, UDC's role in social justice, but uh, for particularly like uh, in the view of Black Lives Matter and uh, the, uh, events like that, um, past four or five years of resurgence of racism and the end of a gay and lesbian uh, uh, violence and activism. And so we uh, have a Created some uh, lesson plans that really, really work well. We work with various uh, of the uh, organization campus that uh, work on social justice issues. We found this to be very rewarding. The students have found it to be very rewarding as well. It's a, been a light bulb moment for a lot of them. They see themselves, uh, they uh, see the use of primary source materials in a way that they have not before, but they have not realized as well. We all we found this to be a very rewarding and enriching experience for them, and uh, they also become better researchers. They and they've also become better in terms of uh, better analysts, better able to analyze historical events. So uh, with that, I will uh, conclude my presentation and uh, ask for uh, any questions or comments or that the. Uh, uh, you might have uh, some problem with the problems with my audio, so if you might want to submit your your uh, questions in writing, and uh, I will answer them with this type of. I appreciate that you uh, uh, I appreciate your attention and your and coming to our Yeah, we will. Uh, we will take any questions, and we'll try and relay them to you. Or we can. We can certainly try and put them into the chat, Chris. If we have any, is there are there any questions in the room? Anybody would like to ask Chris a question? Uh, again, having problems with my audio, I just wondering if you could. Okay, I uh, I do have one question that uh, Lee. So I'll I'll pull up the chat window here, and I'll see if I can pull that up here, Chris. 
Thank you. Do you want me to type it in? Or can we just, uh... You want to type it in? Or I don't care. Yeah, I'm just curious about what kinds of contemporary collecting they do, whether they, is it as simple as collecting like analog records from student groups, or whether they do more uh, like story sharing projects or web archiving. Is that? I can't see <laughs> What type of contemporary collecting are you doing, web archiving, et cetera? Can you see that question, Chris? Question is, what type of contemporary collecting are you doing, web art, archiving, and so on? Uh, primarily, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, right now we're doing a lot of oral history, most of the uh, uh, current students, the current student activists, and just kind of the elements of the activism case, so issues Questions? Over in the. Thank you very much for your time. Who? Yeah. Just stop sharing what we want. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, could uh, you discuss the, uh, the new relationship with DCU and DC City Archives? Um, what a. Uh, what they're expecting to achieve, and also some of the controversies uh, that seem to be rising in the media about the uh, membership. Discuss the relationship with DCU and DC Government Archives. Uh, it, uh, both the benefits that they're expecting and um, some of the, the, the negative uh, consequences on, on campus. Consequences, right? Yeah. Hey, how about that? All right, another question for you, Chris. Discuss the, the relationship with DCU and the DC Government Archives, the benefits and consequences on campus. Relationships between UDC 
we uh, work actively with uh, the DC archives uh, uh, in the when uh, I refer to students uh, quite a bit often to uh, DC archives uh, 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 to DC government archives when that's their their need when uh, they have a need for this and I think that uh, the, the benefits of uh, having, uh, I think, they supplement each other very well. Uh, we uh, don't, uh, there isn't a, a, any sort of overlap between the two of them. But our archives, the UDC archives, is strictly an institutional archive with some uh, government documents pertaining to uh, uh, specifically in UDC, but also to uh, education in general, and so the benefits of, uh, so there's uh, a synergistic relationship between the two of them, and uh, the students and the faculty and other researchers have benefited uh, greatly from this, and they've gotten the information that they needed, and uh, I can't think of uh, the consequences that have been mutually beneficial for both of the uh, researchers, whether they be academic or students or otherwise, and, uh, and for us. So uh, 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 we value our relationship with DC archives and the other uh, archives in, in uh, DC we find this to be a very constructive relationship, and uh, we hope to broaden and deepen uh, this relationship over time. Okay. Right. Any more questions? Chris, I really would like to... Uh, Chris, I want to thank you very much for uh, making this possible. And uh, I, apo I apologize that you were unable to get down here in person. Uh, and uh, I, what I will do is I will uh, share your email with people that if anybody would like to reach out to you and with... Oh. Anyone to the come up to the UDC to look, uh, look at our archives and visit our archives and if there's any research needs that, that you uh, believe that we can handle, I certainly would be very happy to fulfill those. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. UDC, yes. All right, so yeah, if anybody wants his email address, that's it there in the chat. So you can uh, reach out to him uh, with any additional questions or comments. Um, and as he said there, he, I'm sure he would be happy to, uh, to um, host you at UDC uh, and see any of the rich collections that he's got there. Uh, but thank you all very much for working through us with this uh, technical issues that we had with this great presentation. Um, thanks to Chris for making himself available wherever he is, somewhere in the state of New York. Um, for those of you that are still here, I'm going to invite Lee to come on up here. Uh, we are just going to roll right into our uh, informal feedback session. Um, and Feel free to uh, hit us up with any questions, comments. As I like to say in any meeting that I'm in, moans of despair, cries of anguish, um, things that you would have liked to have seen, things that you would uh, want us to do differently in the future. Uh, Lee's already said she's not doing it next year. If you, uh, you know, put some money in the tip jar on your way out, I might be persuaded to do it next year. Um, so, and if you're leaving, thank you for coming. Uh, there might still be some people downstairs. Yeah, you can go check in with those. Also, check out the rotunda. 
Please check out all the exhibits. I understand the World Series trophy is in the sports exhibition downstairs. So, all right. Hit us. ASL shift change. <laughs> Elizabeth? Thanks for doing this. It's been great to be back. Yes. All right. I'm not, a, I'm not below starting just calling on people. You just did. <laughs> yeah. I just did. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to start calling on people because people whose names I know. You know. And there's only a few people left in the room whose names I know. <laughs> I will just make a quick comment and say just thank you all for coming. I think we started to plan this a little later than we would have in the years pre-pandemic. So thank you all for being up for experimenting and going with the flow with us. Um, I think we're really thinking, especially moving into the next few years and seeing where the pandemic takes us, but just I would be curious to know about whether like the existing format that we did this time around, like the same as we used to, still works, whether you thought being in person was a good thing. Um, those are just some things we're gonna be thinking about moving forward in the future with this event. This could be a time to transform it. It could be a time to keep the original structure. Just some food for thought. Well, I commented that. Um, this is the first time that I have come to anything put on uh, archives or DC archives. Um, and um, I know that it's the first year coming out of the pandemic, which is supposed to mean that everything's back to normal, but it doesn't work that way at all. Mm -hmm. It's great in practice. So thank you for starting my good practice again. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that, that I'm sort of uh, in a different archive space than most people here, but I would have loved if there was a round table time for a panel to hear about how people are dealing with different things they're doing. Just uh, some more back and forth conversation. So kind of like a birds of a feather kind of event where people could choose like a topic, like reference or something and connect on it? Yeah, or have um, maybe two or three different people from different institutions address similar ideas like like a ask me anything kind of thing, like just, you know. Yeah. Or maybe a, a, like a shorter presentation, like for instance, we, we had a person present about the movie. Um, so maybe mm -hmm. two or three institutions that have found some beginning of the movie, or two or three that started from scratch, or two or three that were working on student engagement as part of their Sure. Thank you. Can I jump on to that? Like, I think this last session here it might have been really beneficial to hear about some different institutions and then maybe even have some more clear examples of maybe some of the successes. Like, and, you know, we had an audiovisual opportunity here, but it was still text some more examples of like, successes or challenges. I think it could have benefited from having multiple people involved with presenting and also having some more, not really good at Maybe you know, more constituents as well. Um, like the Kennedy Center presentation was marvelous. Um, it could have been even more expansive if you had like, somebody not in archives, who is using archives in a different way for the first time, or uh, examples of school programs, or, or how we, the great mechanism in which we figured out how to get the right box onto the right shelf. It's all pretty um, amazing. And I would have loved to think even more about how that we started. So I will say that when 
the Archives Fair first started, the DC Archives Fair, it was started by the National Archives Assembly, which is a professional organization of NARA staff. And it was specifically targeted for repositories here in DC. We partnered with the Smithsonian Professional Group. We also used to bring in the Library of Congress Professional Group, and we broadened it to include the Mid-Atlantic Regional Archives Conference. And it just sort of, it grew and grew and grew, and it was started, you know, and then we had the benefit of being able to have technological advancements that we had originally were going to live stream a lot of these sessions. And we did live stream, I want to say, in 2018. And we recorded all of these sessions today. And we will have, they'll be all edited together, and they will be put on the NARA YouTube channel. And we'll send that link out to everybody when that's all ready. And so what we will do and what we will continue to do is that with more lead time, I think what, as what Lee was saying is that when we have more lead time, we can hopefully have more sessions. We can have, you know, because we have this space, there's another conference room here, there's another conference room there. So we would have the ability to have run as many as three or four different session blocks, you know, three or four different sessions per block and have up to 12 sessions over the course of a day. And we could have round tables, we could have panel sessions, we could have, you know, lightning talks, things like that. We could have theater present presentations. Um, I think the, the options are limitless. Um, now, I would like, actually, I would like to ask Jim a question, is for people with, where you are in a situation where you, you have a need, do you have, when you go to conferences that you, I mean, could you contacted me to, arrange for to do this presentation what is your sort of expectation when you go to a professional meeting as far as to be able to present and be presented to Really, it depends on the expectations, too, of all of them. The team of interpreters, the flexibility of schedule. Often we have a situation where we want to go professionally to a conference and, or, an, or a professional organization, and we have an established schedule, and we also decide interpreter availability. And then often the professional organization has no budget to hire interpreters for the full day, and especially to be able to accommodate us if we all decided to go in different areas. So really, this is the ideal setup, what we had today. So this logistically makes sense, where they're seated, the camera, everybody moving around, and that can be very typical, and also it's a very common experience for us. So. This has been really good. Yeah. I mean, I, I was very happy that you were here today, and I was happy that we were able to make those accommodations for you. And I was in your presentation when I heard that you had gone to SAA, because it is not my recollection that SAA has had interpreters in the past. Yeah, yeah, that's. That's the point of the conference that we were talking about during COVID. So that was online. Right. And that does make it easier to provide services if they have online services and they're able to hire an interpreter remotely. 
and but you know on site can be a bigger challenge and that's one of the feedbacks that I was going to share with you so sometimes it's uh, a good idea to also have hybrid mode for next year maybe that could be a consideration to make the conference remote as well as in person well we're glad you were able to be here me too <laughs> Anyone else? This is maybe more a point about outreach, but I didn't really know about this until I went to Merrimack this past week. Uh, then somebody happened to plug it in the DC office, but just making sure that you're on absolutely every list so that gets sent out. I know I shared I shared it with the Merrimack administrator. Mm -hmm. I shared it with the Merrimack caucus reps, the the DC, Maryland, and Virginia ones. Uh, I did put it on the Merrick Facebook page. Uh, Lee sent it out to SIASC. I sent it out to the NORA assembly page. Where are you? I'm with the Park Service, and I'm actually a records manager, so that's what I was going to say is like getting in through those kind of like back avenues too. Yeah. Um, and actually, my wife, who works at the Smithsonian, she's like, Did you send it out to the library schools? And I was like, Yeah, I forgot about the library schools. Um, and the thing is, I, I can't put my finger on, there used to be like, you know, there was the old archives list, the archives and archivist list, and like the SA distribution list, and I was like, I, can't, I couldn't put my finger on where I needed to send it to make sure that I hit as many people as possible. And, um, but again, it's, again, it's, we've sort of lost how to get in touch with people over the past three years because well, I mean, yes it happened to be that it was last week yes um, then it was like me emailing my boss and like hey i know i'm at a conference right now but is it <laughs> i'm also not coming in monday <laughs> so maybe the timing of that I'm certainly hoping that now that we've had an archives fair in this new pandemic era, that more people will be aware of it. And then when we start planning a lot earlier in the next year, this will be a bit less of an issue than it was this year. I wanted to add something also. We, uh, we got our information through Merrick too, mm -hmm. and we wanted to know if we could see uh, with the WR, the World Research Library Connection? Uh, consortium. 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 So we could see more uh, institutions that are similar to ours being able to attend here. Uh, sure. That would be a good idea. Jim, do you have a contact for them? For the WRLC? Yeah, I can definitely put that on the webpage if you want me to, I'd be happy to. You can just email me, email me the yeah, contact. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, perfect. So I, uh, I'm a NAR employee, so I would say even internally, um, it's, there was it didn't seem to be very much communication. Uh, I think there was one uh, mention in the desperation post, but even the most recent uh, like weekly roundups and things, uh, there wasn't a mention of that disorder, which I know in the past uh, has been widely attended by NAR employees. I know a number of colleagues who just didn't know. Are you an assembly member? Uh, I am an aspiring assembly member, so I probably could be after today. Um, we d I did send it out to the assembly membership, so it did go out to that. Uh, it was on the external NARA facing calendar. Um, I don't know whether it was on the internal facing NARA calendar. Um, and I did have some people post it internally. I, I don't know whether it was on the ICN though. Um, but again, that was just something that it didn't get pushed out to as many outlets as I would have liked to have it done. Um, and, I, and I think that was just a factor of we got the ball rolling late. Um, 
and there are only so many hours in the day. <laughs> and I would say also just trying to get our groove back, too. I yeah. Mean, it has been, what, three, three four years. years? Yeah. So. 19 was the last one. 18 is the last one I remember, but Same. I think there was one in 19. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes, today was it was our oh. our in service day. Yeah. So they, they close the research rooms, but then then they turn around and schedule a bunch of meetings. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we when we started looking at dates for the archives fair today, the reason we selected the date for today is because we wanted the archivist to be able to speak. And as she said in her remarks, she leaves for Seattle tomorrow. So today was the only day that she could speak this week. And this was the week we wanted. So that's why we scheduled it for today, knowing that she was on travel the rest of this week. And then we were like, OK, we can have the archivist, but we won't have anybody in research services because it was an in-service day. So. Well, again, yes, one more in the back. I just wanted to say thank you again. And there's plenty, plenty of hindsight. It's all easy to come with lots of suggestions. Um, but having uh, just put together a large conference for the last week, I really appreciate um, how hard it is to get going again and to pull back all the little threads and pieces that you used to have in place and don't anymore. Yeah. This is not my first rodeo, but it's also, unfortunately, not my last rodeo. <laughs> first pandemic, post pandemic. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you all very much for coming, and I will. We will see you in 2024, if not before. Thanks all. Thanks all. Thank you so much for everything. We appreciate you inviting us. Thank you for providing the interpreters too. We very much appreciate it. Right. This. This. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Thank you.